of our brains are different in quite subtle ways, but people with synesthesia just have different brains that are wired differently for whatever reason. They just think it's uh, a bit odd more than anything. I wouldn't say people were um, looking at it like it was a bad thing, like you're a bit crazy or anything like that, just you're a bit odd, maybe. They actually mentioned the name there, synesthesia, and that was the very first time I'd heard of it. And all it was was a programme about loonies, basically. It was about people that had peculiar perceptions. Uh, and she was put across as being some sort of oddity. Someone came up to me and said that they thought that I was... Um, they thought that my synesthesia um, wasn't real. And um, I'm... It really pissed me off. So people with synesthesia experience the ordinary world in very extraordinary ways. So the way that we think about synesthesia is that um, we can think of it in terms of three defining properties. So one property is that it's elicited, and what I mean by that is that it's triggered by something else that doesn't normally do it. So one thing triggers another. So music might trigger colour, or seeing something might trigger a colour or a taste. I first noticed um a sort of connection between what I saw and what I heard mm. um, when I was nine or ten um, and it was when I first listened to music when I was walking about so it was when the Walkman was first invented um, and for the first time I could actually experience sound on tinny little headphones but still headphones while I was walking around and I noticed that some of the things I saw corresponded to some of the things I, I heard and some of the things I heard made me sort of hallucinate. I'm going to show Nick a song by Madlib. It's called Slim's Return. I, overall, I experienced it as um, a kind of metal and wood kind of combo. The colours I, I saw were um, dark brown and blue, kind of, kind of like um, a kind of steely blue. Um, the Rhodes keyboard was definitely the blue, the blue thing. And there's a kind of bell timbre on on the Rhodes. Um, that was sort of like a blue, a blue kind of glow. The funny thing about you saying about blue, the album is called Shades of Blue. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Yeah. Sometimes I think that part of the process of making um, art requires you to be able to interpret one media into another and that's a synesthetic interpretation. In fact, my grandmother, who was a cook and a painter, um, used to describe lots of things synesthetically, uh, or at least I think, I think that's what she was doing when I think back on how she used language. So she used to describe leek and potato soup um, needing to taste like velvet. Um, so I, I kind of like to think that she was synesthetic as well. Tonally, that was much more um, in the red kind of spectrum. It's a bit rusty, I don't know, in terms of its texture, um, so a little bit flaky. I don't know if that's um, the way I'm feeling today, because the other one, um, the other song was a bit rusty as well. So do you think it's sometimes affected by emotions on your everyday basis? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a gift, definitely. Um, it enables me to do things that are um, unique in sound design and composition and um, it enables me to um, well a lot of my work is about synesthesia so you know I can't really I couldn't really do it without being able to experience things in that way mm -hmm. I think a lot of creative practice is as a result of synesthesia but then there's another thing that's happening which is that new technology allows people to experience um, media in a convergent way and that's that's like a sort of uh, a new type of, of synesthesia that's brought about by technology 
not brought about by our own sort of neurological connections or misconnections. The other characteristic is that it occurs spontaneously uh, and without the person being able to control it. Uh, and we've got some evidence that people can't switch their synesthesia on and off, it's always there. In the same way as your peripheral vision is always there, but you're not always aware of it and you're not always thinking about it. I think it was probably something that I was born with, but I wasn't aware of it until I got a little bit older. Things like songs, I could attribute colours to them for no particular reason and again things like days of the week have always had a colour it's just that quite often no one really asks you what colour is Tuesday A is always red B is always blue and K is orange for instance whereas some I have to think about them a little bit more when I say A is red I'm not seeing red in front of my eyes it's just an association similar to a memory is probably the only way I can describe it it's a nice thing, like I don't think it's a burden or anything like that. I think, for instance, synesthesia really helps my memory. If people were more aware of synesthesia, then just general discussion might make more people consider what's going on inside their heads, how people process things differently. The third one is that it feels like a, a real percept. It feels like something that is perceptual. It feels like a touch or uh, a taste or a colour or, or, or something visual or auditory. And this is obviously harder to pin down because people with synesthesia will say, well, it is like seeing, but it's not just like seeing. You know, I can tell my synesthesia apart from my real vision. So that's a, that's a very hard one to pin down. But I think it's important to have that in the definition of synesthesia. Otherwise, any association that you might uh, have could be called synesthesia. I've got a, I've lived with synesthesia all my life. Um, my earliest memories of it as a, as a real condition when I was four or five. Um, I can date this precisely because I remember having synesthetic taste while I was at school. One of the things about synesthesia is that when, when you do get these tastes and flavours, they, they, they simply don't change. An old girlfriend from when I was 16 contacted me and said she had, uh, she'd found a notebook. And in the notebook was a list of names and to the right of them was a load of flavours, a load of tastes, um, sweets and crisps and all this. It turned out that one night we sat down, we must have been bored, and uh, I actually said, all your friends have got, got flavours and tastes, did you know that? And she said, no, it looks at me rather oddly. And she actually wrote down all the names and all the, the flavours I told her. And it just got put to one side, but it was really odd, because I mean, this, this has come to life, what, 35 years later? And I actually submitted that list to uh, the university that was studying me, who had a, a previous list of three and a half thousand words and names on there that I'd given with associated tastes. And they matched them up and they were spot on. Every one of them was spot on. Alexander McQueen. To be honest, it's a bit like earwax. Uh, it, it's, got a, it, it's like candy wax with a bit more, a bit more bite to it. McQueen, which is the Dominant taste in the entire name, although you know Alexander's quite strong. It's uh, very strong and it's like a sponge cake if you cover it in condensed milk and flash it all. David Lynch. With the David, you've got the, uh, the taste of the, the cloth with the sucking on a sleeve kind of taste. And Lynch is. Uh, It's like, it's like very, very salty hand, but very probably slightly salty These things will never change what they can ask me in 30 years time and things like this. I think synesthesia has affected the popular art, yes, yeah, simply because um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of artists with synesthesia. When we actually look at the, at the creative process, more and more artists are uh, coming forward, so it does affect the popular arts. There's a lot of uh, musicians that are now saying, well I've always done this, because it's one of the things with synesthesia, it's so natural, it's exactly like breathing, doesn't it? You know, you've always got to. David Hockney um, used to really base his early career designing sets on it. He used to design sets for the New York for New York Broadway plays, and he used to go in there and he'd listen to the music, and that's where he'd get his like, inspiration from, for all the splashes of colour. The wall has a sort of, um, it's, it's got a, it's, it's a very thick kind of meat, I suppose it's a bit like um, 
it's a bit like cold, cold hank of ham, cotton. It tastes like uh, roast potato, I suppose would be the best way of describing that, and otherwise with some of the crispy shell. It wasn't very potato and fibery. Polyester. What's that pudding you get that's got with it? What's that? Is it similar? Tapioca. That's what, it, that's what that tastes like. Tapioca. Catmull. It's very strong in that. That's straight away. That's like Scottish short. There's one in 23 people who've got synesthesia in one form or another. Bear in mind there's a lot of different items. What I think is, uh, where I think it affects people is, with it being 1 in 23, in every school classroom there is at least one synesthete in there. And um, as president of the UK Synesthesia Association, I get a lot of emails from parents and from children who are in school who find it quite difficult to concentrate in these environments. So, all I'm hoping is that people get to know about it, and people get to know that it does affect it too. School children in the classroom, and it doesn't affect adults in the workplace because it can't do it. It's not going to change the world.